Okay, Andrew. Oh, there we go. Okay, Andrew, you had asked a question about craving, and the way that you phrased it was is that it was big and long-lasting. How, in fact, did you did you phrase that? What did you say? What was your original question? Oh, I think I said that it was uh, coming up a lot for me, and that it didn't. I wasn't feeling able to just like throw it out of my mind or like redirect. Mm -hmm. Lines. But in fact, during that time of thinking that you couldn't throw it out of your mind, it was actually coming in and out and in and out and in and out anyway. And every time that it came back in, you wanted it to be out again. Mm -hmm. But every time that it came back in, you thought it had been there all along. Okay, this is the kind of point that we can make is, is that things happen pretty fast in the mind. And we have the, the idea that things are there uh when in fact they're not mm -hmm. um and so this is why the mahasi method is so intent on looking at the arising and the passing away mm -hmm. it's not just the watching the craving arise and arise and arise and arise and arise and arise which is the way that you're looking at it yeah now it's time to start looking at it as arise and pass away arise and pass away and arise and pass away and when it passes away that's because something new in the mind has arisen mm -hmm. which means then that you're quite capable of every time that the thought of craving arises you can let it pass away immediately well i'm glad that i don't have to continue with that okay so Let's look at it from a kind of a theoretical perspective. And what we're meaning by that is the layout that the Buddha has given called the Paticca Samuppada, which is also called dependent origination. Now, the best way for the, this uh, process to be taught, um, it winds up that craving is, I think, like step eight or nine out of the 12 step sequence so we're pretty well deep into it so um just as an introduction and just the basis of it the paticca samuppada has a foundation or a base to it and that base is the five aggregates mm -hmm. but the five aggregates are also the four foundations of mindfulness with a, just a different perspective or a different breakdown and that the important teachings of the Buddha has to do with the fact that in, in these five aggregates, there is no actual permanent, everlasting, long-term existence. That this is one of the big mistakes of Western Buddhism is the translation of the word um, uh, anatta into the word no self, because that really, really confuses everybody because the word self has a variety of definitions and so what we can say instead to understand anatta we can talk about it in the sense that in the body there is nothing permanent there's nothing everlasting there's nothing long term going on which is the way that traditionally religions have looked at the self in the sense of a soul Mm -hmm. that the soul is strong enough to survive death. So we're talking about something that's permanent, perhaps even everlasting. All right. And so in the body, there is nothing permanent. Everything will break down, down to the DNA and the molecules, and even water can be broken into oxygen and hydrogen. In fact, that's what trees do that they take carbon dioxide from wherever it may be found they and with the photosynthesis process they also break down the water into the oxygen give off the oxygen some uh, as byproduct because they don't need it and then recombine the hydrogen and the carbon with what other things like old sodium mostly it's sulfur and uh, well actually it's mostly a uh, nitrogen so the point is, is that even the water that gets into a tree is temporary. It's going to be broken down and the oxygen, I mean, that's where the oxygen in the atmosphere came from. It used to all be kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> captured in uh, carbon dioxide. So everything about the body is temporary. Nothing, nothing is everlasting about the body. It is always just a Nietzsche. It's temporary. 
things arise and pass away, itches arise and pass away, diseases arise and pass away, life itself arises and passes away. And the breath is our key to that in the sense of watching the rising and the falling of the breath. It arises and passes away also. And so getting into the rhythm of the breathing, it gets us into also the rhythm of watching the mind. We also know that there is nothing about the way that we feel that's permanent. Sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're pissed off, sometimes you're sad, sometimes you're afraid, sometimes you're joyful. Up and down and up and down and up and down. And we think <clears throat> that basically um, there is nothing permanent about it. But when those emotions are managed ignorantly, that means that that, uh, that temporary emotion winds up being the most important thing of the moment. The most important thing of the day is how we feel, that our feelings literally drive us because we're ignorant. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. We're not watching the fact that these are arising and passing away, these impulses of feelings give rise then to that craving and clinging and longing and I got to go do it simply because those feelings arose and passed away. But they are temporary. They do just come and go and come and go. Also, um, consciousness is dependent and it is not permanent. A lot of people in many cultures think that it's consciousness itself that's permanent and everlasting. Even Christianity has that kind of view as contraposed to, say, the Muslims who have the idea that it's going to be this physical body that is actually resurrected. Mm -hmm. And so if you can scatter the body parts of your enemy all over the place, then he's unlikely for him to be able to be reborn because he can't get all those body parts together again. Mm -hmm. Just some of the old stories, okay? So we, the Christians know that I am not the body. The body has died, and but they do have the idea that it's their consciousness that goes to heaven, mm -hmm. or it's the consciousness that goes to hell, to where the whole teaching of the Buddha is, no, consciousness is not permanent either, but in fact, it's quite temporary. It, I mean, your consciousness goes away when <clears throat> you go to sleep at night. Most of the time, consciousness goes away about a second or so before an automobile accident that will go, will go blind that, you know, will, will freeze mm -hmm. that the, the startle reaction, he comes in front of me and I don't know what to do. And so I hit him instead. Okay. There that's life, loss of consciousness. Many times, in fact, we lose consciousness of the sensory awareness when we're lost in the consciousness of the mind. Mm -hmm. We're not even paying attention to what we're conscious of in the, in the reality that, in fact, consciousness only generally pays attention at one thing at a time. And when there is nothing there, there is no consciousness there for that item. Okay, so uh, generally when things are quiet, we're not conscious of the hearing. We're only conscious of the hearing when we can hear something. And so meditators start listening when there's nothing to hear, and then they call that ringing of the ears, to where in fact it's just something that's part of the human mechanism. We don't need to go into that, other than the point that everything about our feelings arises and passes away. Everything within consciousness arises and passes away, and even in our perception, the process of making something out of it arises and passes away, which means that too is not permanent. This is the whole point is, is then the five aggregates, including the Sankara, and you can say the Sankara is the sum total of all your memories, or another way of saying it is that this is the closest to how normal people identify who they are. Who they are is what has happened to them their whole life. Okay, that I am a sum total of everything that's happened to me. And we kind of see ourselves that way with memory and whatnot like that. But the point is, is that that memory is quite volatile. Mm -hmm. It changes. Sometimes the wrong data is accessed. And it's temporary. It's fleeting. It's not me. 
then in fact one of the ways of understanding it is is that I and you are both sum totals of all the lies and malicious gossip and the rules and the laws and all that kind of stuff that we've ever heard, and that's who we are, is this Sankara, except that this Sankara is a big mess. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we recognize, well, that actually there's no, nothing permanent in there, that memories will fade and then they could be resurrected again. I mean, that's really interesting. You've, you've talked about, you've heard about things called amnesia where somebody gets hit in the head and then they don't know who they are and they're desperately trying to figure out who they are and dwelling in the past rather than whip de do. I'm so happy. I don't have to remember any of that stuff. Get a start over. But most of the stories are about amnesia or somebody trying to desperately reconnect with their past. And finally, they find one thread. And when they pull on it, immediately all that stuff comes back again. Right. Very interesting that way. So the sand cars also are temporary. They come and they go and, and, and whatnot. And there's nothing really permanent in there. If we can take those five aggregates as a base for there is no self then where does selfishness arise from? Where does the sense of self arise? That's the study of Paticca Samuppada. Mm -hmm. Is the base is that there is nothing permanent there. How do we get into the delusion that there is something permanent? Okay. And so these five aggregates as the base, um, when consciousness comes up, it, um, perception goes into the grab bag of trips, tricks called our memory to reconstruct you know, the object that we have uh, perceived or been conscious of. But we want to make it our own in the sense of understanding. So there's two kinds of consciousness. There's the consciousness of sensory input and then there is the consciousness of understanding the sensory input. The example of that is, is that I see a tree and then I say, I see what you mean. Right. Even when I say I see a tree, I'm actually uh, getting some perception in some Sankara about trees. That if I didn't have any Sankaras, I could just see, but I wouldn't know it was a tree. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we can think of then is that being able to understand that what I see is a tree is because of perception and Sankara. I've got trees stored in the old memory bank and I've got the, uh, the discernment processor, the perception that can bring up that tree. Okay, so here's the point. That is the tree. The tree that we have understanding of, the tree in the mind, that's what impacts us, not the actual tree out there. Mm -hmm. That that tree out there, in fact, in the Paticca Samuppada, that perception process is called a Nama Rupa. Name it's taken. To, pardon? It's name and form. Right, exactly. And now I'm describing exactly what that means. It means that we take the form or the object and we name it. Cool. And what we work with is the internal object of the named product or the understanding of it. That's what impacts us, not the actual uh, rupa. It's the nama that, that hits us. Mm -hmm. So... Even if somebody hits us with their fist on the arm and our arm hurts, it's not the fist that made the arm hurt. It's the sensations of the arm that's been hit is I don't like it. I don't like how the arm feels. That's the pain. The pain is not getting hit. The pain is I don't like the sensation that's in the body. Now, let's find out where that I came from, All right? It's the I don't like it. So after, that, after the sensation impacts one, feelings arise. The feelings are of liking and not liking, or the feeling of I'm not sure whether I like it or not. 
Uh, some people understand that because it's translated wrongly into um, neutral feelings, but they're not neutral feelings. If the, if the feelings were truly neutral, that's like no feeling at all, no impact. But sometimes we get really, really impacted strongly with a kind of feeling that is neither liking it or not liking it. It's actually we don't even know whether we like it or not. It just impacts us. It hits us really, really hard. Uh, this happens often when politicians are confronted with their lies. They get, you know, startled or shocked or whatever. They don't know what to do. They become confused. They don't know what's going on because they thought that this was an interview, you see. And so now all of a sudden they don't like it. And so you've got this mixing of liking and not liking. And that's what causes confusion. This is what causes doubt. Is because not that we don't know what it is, and that's enough. It's because we don't know enough about whether to like it or not. That's interesting because yeah, I'm thinking back to like when I was experiencing craving earlier today. I almost felt like I was like split in two because at first I was like, oh yeah, here's like the dissatisfaction of like not liking it, but then I was like, oh wait, but like over here, like there's also this like. <laughs> liking of it and being excited for like the sensory gratification is just like oh like yeah these sort of different yes. levels of, yeah mm -hmm. and so that's the state of confusion of the mind is because we don't know what whether we like it or not and sometimes that happens because um like kaboom or maybe a yes no mm -hmm. or one mind moment there's a yes and the next mind moment it's a no and sometimes it goes, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And we don't know what to make out of that. And that's confusion. We go back and forth and back and forth. Now, all three of these kind of feelings, if they are ignorant, they lead to dukkha. And we'll talk about exactly how that happens. The confused feeling almost always rots into not liking in the sense of we uh, it's natural to choose, you've heard expressions like, it's better to vote for the devil you know than the devil you don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or um, we can think of uh, the darkness in the sense of we don't know what that is. It might be dangerous. It might be spooky. But really, the reality is, is that we just don't know. And so we're taking precautions because it might be dangerous. In other words, this would be a false positive for the uh, self-preservation instinct to arise. Mm -hmm. It's because we don't know, so it may be dangerous. And so we consider that it is dangerous until it proves itself otherwise, mm -hmm. which means it proves that we can like it. And otherwise, we're in the category of not liking it. This is, in fact, based in... Um, the primitive evolution that can be uh, um, thought of in context of the, the survival instinct as um, a subset of that called the territorial instinct. So my territory is what I know, my home, my area, my place, and the things that come into my area or things outside of that area, if I try to go out, are dangerous because I don't know them. Wolf packs are like that. They've really had an interesting experiment because they had a time when there was wolves all over and then they shot them all and now there's no wolves. Up until the 1970s, they reintroduced uh, wolves into um, uh, <clears throat> the great Northwest, including um, the, the national parks up there. But they put radio collars on these dogs, on these uh, wolves. And they really did understand about how the territories were set up and wound up they uh they introduced seven packs and those seven packs stayed in their territory and they would mark their territorial boundaries with urine so this is our territory and that's your territory and whatnot like that and so uh this part of the human mind then uh, that territorialism is is that we we like and understand that which we know and that which we don't know, we don't like or understand. Okay, 
So that's the basis of tribalism, it's the basis of racism, it's the basis of chauvinism, it's the basis of uh, misogyny and all of that kind of stuff, rich against poor, top down, back and forth, and all of that has to do with the issue of, if I don't know what it is, I don't like it. So that's a very dangerous thing to happen, is that we, we, instead of having three feelings, and just being confused and say, well, I don't know what it is, but it's not harmful right now. That's the thing. That's why humans are so greedy for information is because they want to know so that they can feel secure about it. Mm. Otherwise, if they don't know what it is, it's dangerous. Right? That's just a, um, an instinctual reaction that we have to these feelings. So if we don't like something, we want to get rid of it. If we like something, then we, if we like it ignorantly, that means that we like it in the way of, <clears throat> oh, I like it and I am drawn to it. I am attracted to it because I will be better off if I am close to it or if I have it or if I own it, mm -hmm. right? That's the delusion because just because you like something doesn't mean that it will improve your life. That in fact, the wanting it and not having it has just now deteriorated your life because now you want something that you don't have. And wanting something that we don't have then can rot into wor working really hard to try to get it so that we'll feel okay because we liked it in the first place. We liked it, therefore we want it. Now we come to the point of clinging. So this is the, in the poly, this is from the point of the image that's made in the mind through perception is called salayatana. From the salayatana, the poly is pasta, it, it hits us. Not what we see, not the reality of the situation, but what we make of reality is what impacts us. Mm -hmm. That's what gives rise to the feeling of liking, not liking, or not sure. Okay. That's Vedana. From Vedana, it goes to Tanha. Tanha, actually, you can hear the word thirst in there. Okay. The Tanha is actually the thirsting for something I wanted in the sense that now, all of a sudden, simply because I see water, C-E-E, -E, not C-E-A, I see water, therefore, I am dry. I want water, right? I see water, I want water. Before I was not even thirsty until I look at the bottle of water and now I see the water, now I'm thirsty. Okay, I want it. Okay, if I want the water and uh, I don't get it, then I'm longing for it or clinging to it. Now, the danger is, is that generally when we want what we, uh, when we get what we want, we wind up having to now take care of it. We're respond we thought we wanted it because it's mine now. I've got to take care of it because if I lose it, then I'll go back into a state of wanting. I'll go back into a state of disappointment if I don't keep it. But the real issue is, is that if I don't necessarily want it, then it doesn't matter whether I lose it or not. Mm -hmm. Or if I don't want it, then I've got no problems with craving. There, in fact, there is a very, very famous story about Achan Po, uh, excuse me, Achan uh, uh, Cha and uh, uh, Achan Samedo, who were at a um, retreat. Actually, no, it was a ceremony, a Katen ceremony, where all of the young women in the um, village were all dolled up to come to the, you know, like people, women dress up at uh, church, mm -hmm. Sunday going to meeting clothing. Okay, so they're all dressed up, and Achan Cha nudges Achan Tomato, who wasn't quite an Achan at that time, and says, what do you think? 
and Achan Sumedho being right um, up on Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, he knew exactly what to say. He says, I like it, but I don't want it. This is an amazing statement for you to understand that, yes, there's all kinds of delightful, beautiful things out there that the mind can see. If you can be sharp enough so that you can recognize that you do, in fact, like something, but that you don't want it enough to bother to do anything about it. So begin to start noticing your liking. When you see a a girl who was all ducked up, making herself attractive, and so when you are attracted to her, recognize that. Oh, I like that, and I want it. Because that's a place where you can cut that off. If you have wisdom at that point, then the liking doesn't have to meld into clinging. Just, I I like it, but I want it. Wait a minute, I don't want it. I like it, and that's enough. I don't have to want it. If I want it, can I stop myself wanting without having to go into clinging? Now, the clinging is called um, upadana. In fact, you can hear the word dana in it. Upadana means, you know, taking. Mm -hmm. Where dana is actually an exchange or giving free exchange, the the word dana. But upadana means... uh, um, almost a theft or a grasping or a clinging or um, almost a vital, uh, a violent act within one's own mind, mm. which you know. I mean, this is it. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, uh, here's where it gets interesting. The Buddha talks about four modes of clinging. These four modes of clinging actually will take us into one of the four woeful states, though they're not necessarily exactly one-on-one. In fact, they're interrelated. But it's also that we work with the concept of four instincts, and that the four instincts match very clearly into the four modes of clinging. I was, it was like yippee ki kaye when I first discovered that. I, this was when I was in, uh, in Watt in, in, in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I just walked away, walked around on cloud nine for days and days to understand this connection between what science understands about the instinctual way of living and the, uh, these four modes of clinging. So let's let's ind- look at each one of them individually for a moment. One of the modes of clinging, in fact, the easiest one to understand once you understand all the others, I'll talk about first, and that's the 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 mode of clinging that humans have that the Buddha refers to as uh, attachments to views or ideas or attachments to concepts. Con- uh, ways that things should should be in a conceptualized framework in the sense of Democrats are better than Republicans or Republicans are better than Democrats. In fact, all of the racial ideas, all of the uh, nationalistic ideas, all of our comparison ideas about we're better than the Trojans or that we are better than cowboys in space or whatever like that that we have that we we have that this is coming out of the territorial instinct this attachment to rights uh excuse me not rights and rules but rather to views about what is better than something else based upon territorial ideas that we cling to our own and then we eschew something that we don't know, something that's foreign, something that's out there someplace because of this basis of confusion and not liking. So that confusion and not liking leads us into taking on views about who is good and who is bad, which football team is better than the other, this is my team, that's your team, this is my stock, that's your stock. All kinds of things that we apply this territorialism to. And that in the way that we operate with it is by waving a banner or having an ID card. Okay, your ID cards, I've probably got several. 
but each one of them identifies who you are. And when you see that card or that passport or that driver's license, you you identify with that that license as if that license represented you. Okay, and the the trick with the Buddha that he talks about is let's not see ourselves as any of those badges or flags or banners or icons or anything that in fact any organization that identifies itself with an icon is something to be avoided without a great deal of wisdom to inspect it to make sure. Why? Because that's the normal way that we cling to things. We cling to it by identifying with it. So when the Republican Party has a bad day, we have a bad day if we identify as a Republican. When the Democrats have a good day and I identify as a Democrat, then I'm going to have a good day. I'm going to feel good because the Democrats, because I identify they are me. I own the Democrats. Then, in fact, um, the foot uh, sports is a good example of this, and that is is that they talk about rooting for my team. Mm -hmm. That team does not belong to you. You're just a fan of that team. If you walk into the corporate board or even into the locker room, they'll throw you out. You don't belong there. It's not yours. Why do you call it your team? Or my country. My country to the V. It's not mine. I don't want it. And so we identify with all kinds of things like this. This is one of the modes of clinging. The next one to identify with is what the Buddha calls Siva Bhatta Paramasa, or our clinging to rites, rules, rituals, and the way things that should be done. This is, in fact, what we, these two things together, we could even call the parent ego state. Not, not the, the instinct itself is not the parent ego state, but what the um, the instinct does uh, in in our uh, nesting instinct is that we collect the knowledge that we need to be safe in the nest. This is why every child listens to his parents and does or rebels against whatever he's told, but he does remember. Over and over and over and over again, this stuff is, is fed to the child and we pile it into that Sankara bucket only to be then barked back out instinctually through this nesting instinct to go along to get along. Okay. The third instinct is the instinct of materialism or actually is called the procreation instinct and that most Westerners, because of Christianity, get really oversexed here. And and but we can understand procreation is not just making babies; it's making any and everything. The first stone axe, in fact. But the guy who, in fact, the way that we can think of it is, is that somewhere along the line, some primitive decided that he was going to use this stone because he just picked it up there to open this carcass bone so that we can get the marrow out. But then something remarkable happened. He just didn't set that stone down. He carried around because this particular stone was very good at the job. Now, we know that using stone tools are something that even otters will do. The otters will go down to the bottom and get a clam and get a stone, come up and surface on this and and lay on their back so that they can take that rock and open that clam. But as soon as they get the clam open, they're only interested in the clam and they'll let the drop water, uh, the rock drop back to the bottom of the water, right? The major difference was the human kept that stone. Mm -hmm. He carried it around. He thought that it was useful and handy that even monkeys will use, um, reeds and things to get grubs out of out of holes get the reed in so that the grub will eat on the reed and then you jerk it out bringing the grub with you as soon as you got that you're interested in the grub you're no longer interested in reed out the reed goes but humans have become attached to material possessions and so we could look at that as your grand total of materialism just look around at all the material things that are there that you have collected that you think are have an identity of who you are. 
Who you are is what you own. Who you are is what you possess. If you get something new, you want to go show it off. This is who I am. I've got something new. The joke is, is when Uncle goes, gets a new car, he goes all over town showing his new car to all of his friends and relatives. He takes it to church and all of that kind of stuff because he wants to show it off. Look at me now. I have a new car. I am different. The material possession made me different. This is one of the modes of clinging. And all three of these uh, modes that I have been talking about are actually in service of the primary instinct, which is the, the preservation instinct, to stay alive. And that's what's been keeping you alive your whole life, is that instinct, that clinging to life. And so uh, in the very, very primitive times, we really needed that because danger could come at any moment. And so it would be very easy for us to, uh, to see that, let's give the examples. Two people are walking down a path, ancient times, maybe with spears, maybe with loin calls, maybe just with nothing at all. But they hear a rustle in the, uh, the bushes behind them. One turns around to see what's happening, and the other one immediately starts to running away. If it was a lion or a tiger or some predator, guess which one of them gets eaten? The one who stopped to investigate. Uh-huh, and the one who immediately ran away in fear survived, right? If that happens enough on an ecological scale, that means that humans are predisposed to be afraid of things when there's nothing there, because it could have also been possible that two guys are walking down, they hear a rustle, and it just happens to be one of the women in the tribe. One's run away and doesn't know that. He survived ignorantly. Mm -hmm. This is what the self-preservation mechanism is all about, and it responds to danger ignorantly rather than wisely. And the culture that we live in is not nearly as dangerous as it was two, three, four hundred thousand years ago. And, but that, uh, that self-preservation instinct is still a remnant, as well as all of these others. That in fact, the human has very little left of the actual territorial instinct. For instance, you can just go walk into any territory, just walk down the street. But you can't walk into somebody's house because now that's their territory. Right, so we do have some territory, but basically we're free to travel. That's what passports are all about, and actually identification. The idea is often associated with the territory that you're in. For instance, a driver's license. There is an international driver's license, but that was on, only a response to local driver's license in any way. Mm -hmm. And passports and whatnot like that <clears throat> are identifications that peg you to a particular territory. So these instincts are in service of the self-preservation instinct, which also is what the Buddha talks about as clinging to the self. So we can cling to the self, we can cling to the support materials and possessions that will protect the self, like axes and swords and spears and bows and arrows and cell phones and all of those kinds of equipment that we make use of to make us feel safe. So we go around armed. And then we also have the, uh, the uh, nesting instinct, which gives rise to all of our rights, rules, rituals, way we're supposed to do things and all of this kind of stuff. And so this is another way that we claim the way that things are supposed to be. And then we, uh, the other way that we cling is we cling with ideas or concepts that get, that's coming out of the territorial instinct. So these are the four modes of clinging, and you see how those four modes of clinging fit directly with the four instincts. Okay, now that we can see that, we can also understand then that these four instinctual clinging methods make us then go into a woeful state. We are reborn into a woeful state because of the clinging. What are the four woeful states? One is the woeful state of hell. 
Hell means you really don't like it here. Hell means that you're hot. Hell means that you're agitated. Hell, okay, so the actual feelings are anger, frustration, fidgeting, uh, uh, being in a situation that we desperately want to get out of would be considered a hell state. And then there is a really not liking it, wanting out, desperately wanting out. People get in states of desperation from time to time. That means that they're in their own mental hell. Then another mode of clinging is the mode of clinging of what is called the frita or the hungry ghost. The hungry ghost is actually identified as a balloon shaped object or maybe a pot with a very, very small mouth. So that the hungry ghost is empty in the side inside and he really desperately wants to be filled up. But the hole that he's got as a mouth is so small that not enough stuff gets in. And so he's constantly in a state of want. People go around like that a lot, always wanting. So it doesn't matter what they get. They just keep wanting more and more and more. That's especially true about money. It doesn't matter how much money you have. I mean, if you've got $5,000, you'd say, wow, $50,000 would be enough. If you've got 50000 then $500,000 might be enough. If you've got 500000 then $5 million might be enough. But if you've got $5 million, then $50 million might be enough. You get where I'm coming from? It doesn't matter what we've got. That's the preta, always hungry, never satisfied. That's a form of clinging is because we keep going back to get something over and over and over again because we don't take satisfaction in that which we do have. So the next one is um, the one that most people spend most of their time in, and that is the draft animal. And the draft animal is really caused by the nesting instinct in the sense that if you don't go along to get along, you're going to get taken out. So an example of that is the horse that's in his own pasture. He really enjoys all the groceries that he can find with all these succulent plants and everything all over his pasture. And the farmer comes in, straps the horse with a plow and makes the horse plow his own field. And so now that the field is, is plowed, the farmer plants what he wants to eat, and the horse is left with nothing but hay. All right, that's the way that we live our lives in this society. The society is the farmer, and each human being is that plow horse going around destroying our own paradise mm -hmm. just because we feel that we've got to, that we're straddled with this um, work that we've got to do. And in fact, the, uh, the plow and the reins and all of that is merely all of the rules, laws, rituals, ways to do things, society's orders. What you've been told to do your whole life, you continue to do it your whole life, even though that you don't get any value out of it, but you mm -hmm. keep doing it anyway. A clear example of that is working for a living. People are now, after COVID, beginning to recognize, say, wait a minute, if I look at the cost-benefit analysis, maybe it's even better if I just don't work because mm -hmm. I'm not getting any value out of it. And that's wise to wake up, to recognize that you're not going to starve. They've been telling, that's one of the lies that they've told you is if you don't work, you don't eat. Guess what? Starvation is generally happening by people who are working very, very hard, and a whole lot of people don't work and they don't starve. So there's no real strong connection between if you don't work, you don't eat. Mm -hmm. There are some conditions, but we can modify those conditions so that you can, in fact, a lot of people do eat without what most people would consider working. But in fact, the monks would say that they're working in a sense that they're maintaining the highest moral standards. Because if they don't maintain the highest moral standards, the, the community and the, uh, uh, the village is not going to support that monk. If they can see him. Okay, so um, 
the idea then is is that we can look at these rituals, these laws, these rules, this way that society is is doing um, with us, and recognize that we do with that to ourselves on the inside also, that we turn ourselves into a draft animal. We do things we don't want to do because we've been told to do it somehow, or you've got to do it somehow. And so we do it, but we resent it. The wiser thing to do would be knowing all of this stuff that we can choose more carefully that which we're going to do and that which we do choose to do, we're going to do it happily because it's our choice to do it based upon Dukkha, Dukkha, Naroda. So an example of that is, is that if I don't want to go to the visa office to get the visa renewed and I don't go, then I'm going to cause big trouble to the police. They're going to cause, they're going to start looking for me, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I'm going to cause a lot of trouble and trouble is going to eventually find me. Knowing that wisely, I can go and get the visa that I need to do. Now I have the choice of I'm going to go get it and being unhappy and grumpy, or can I go do it and be happy and joyful and friendly with the people at the visa office? My choice there. Okay, so this is what we're talking about is, is that we normally go around doing things in drudgery because we don't like to do them. And so we choose to do them and choose to feel bad. We can, in fact, choose to do it or not do it and choose to feel bad or to not feel bad. I would choose to wisely to do what I'm going to do and then feel good about that and then feel good about the stuff that I'm not going to do. But this is the woeful state of the animal world that is very famous in, in Thai. But most Western Buddhists, they think, oh, I'm going to be reborn as a worm or I'm going to be reborn as a, you know, something weird or maybe a mosquito. Other people think I'm going to be born as a flying falcon or giant lion or something like that. But that's not the, the that's much more of a child's or a, a magical way of, of looking at it. Mm-hmm. Normally, the real way of looking at it or the one that's valuable here is to recognize that we are reborn as a dumb animal when we're doing things that we're told to do and we don't like it. Mm-hmm. All right. And then the fourth one on the uh, the list is the Asuras or the, uh, let us say, the heavenly warriors that are all dressed up for battle, but they've got no battle to go to, or more specifically, because they're afraid to go into battle. This is where we see fr- stage fright or we see resistance or reluctance. We also see it in the sense of procrastination. And then we can also see that these things are interrelated. That the nesting instinct and the territorial instinct go together. How do they go together? Because there's only merely just a separation or a boundary between the two in the sense of this is my territory and that's not my territory. So that's a mental state. But other than that, the territorial instinct and the nesting instinct are really almost the same thing. But then you can see that even the nest is kind of a material object also. Mm-hmm. Okay, so these instincts are all tightly bound to each other, just like the four modes of clinging are tightly bound to each other, and so all the woeful states are bound to each other. And these woeful states that we are born into is now the dukkha. Okay, so this is how it goes from uh, uh, pasa, or actually, we started with salyatana, pasa, vedana, tanha. Upadana, now we're going into hell, and that is the bhava, and then roasting in hell of our own mind, and that's the jati. I have now been reborn, and I am now angry. Mm -hmm. I'm an angry uh, being, or I'm reborn reborn as a a frightened um, warrior. I'm reborn as a... uh, hungry ghost, wanting something that I don't have. All of those four states, the woeful states, are in fact then the suffering itself. But the point is, is that it is me that's suffering because I'm the one in hell. How did that happen? 
Well, look at it from this way. Once the uh, the liking and then the grasp or the wanting or the uh, the grasping comes and then the clinging to. Look at the arm here. That as this happens, the clinging requires mentally in our own way of thinking a cling or. It's not just that you're clinging. There's something in there that's doing the clinging. That's the self. And the self is doing the clinging based upon some basic fear or some basic desire. But the desire, if we want something, that means basically that we're afraid that we're incomplete without it. Now that I like it, I've got to have it. What for me will happen if I don't get that Maserati or that Ferrari? Mm -hmm. That I'll be nothing without it. Right. So it's self-preservation instinct then that runs all of these other instincts. And so that's the rise of the self. The rising of the self is when the selfish um, self-preservation instinct comes into play ignorantly. This is why ignorance is such an issue within the teachings of the Buddha. It's in the Four Noble Truths. It's in the uh, Second Noble Truth specifically, and it's also one of the fetters, and it's the foundation of Paticca Samuppada. So this is what we need to do is to have wisdom at the point of contact so that we now can manage the way that we feel, and we can go back and revisit that. So every time that you that something impacts you, check out, how do you feel about it? That if you like something, recognize that you like it. That's okay. You like it. But just because you like it doesn't mean that you have to want it. Mm-hmm. Okay? Or if you don't like it, doesn't mean that you have to do something about it. In fact, one of the things that you can do uh, uh, instead of getting rid of that which you don't like is to be joyful and satisfied that you're strong enough to not have to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. That it really is nothing at all. There's nothing to it. That I'm strong enough to handle that. So I've got an inch on the leg. Just because the leg itches doesn't mean that I've got to scratch it. I'm a big, tough dude. I can handle a little scratch. Okay, so we can actually then manipulate the way that we feel. We don't have to ignorantly continue into the direction of not uh, liking. We can turn that not liking back into a, a joyful, wise liking. We can also be mindful when we see a stranger, if we don't know who they are, let's be open to the fact that they could be a good friend rather than automatically taking the position of who the hell are you? What do you want? Why are you here? You know, instead, we can take the position of, oh, I don't have to assume that territorial instinctual way of if I don't know who it is, it must be dangerous. You can have the position of, I don't know who it is. They're probably going to be a friend. So this is the changing of attitude that we're looking for, but we have to keep remembering to look at what we're, what the mind is doing, to keep remembering, to look at these salyatanas of what kind of thoughts are we having? What kind of impressions are we giving? And when I say impressions, I'm talking about how does this stuff contact us? How do we feel? And that can, is worthy of investigation. And in fact, Anapanasati is designed around this investigation so that when that way we can begin to control the salyatana to have positive thoughts so that that affects us and our feelings then are positive, happy feelings. We can feel secure because we can have the thought process that's associated with that. So rather than in our perception of digging out all of the old garbage of bad feelings, we can intentionally pull out some good feelings and use that to mix our new consciousness so that we have a pleasant salayatana And then that impacts us to have good, positive, wholesome feelings. This is all the process of wisdom. But Bhikkhu Buddha Das is very big on wisdom at the point of contact, to to understand how things are impacting you so that you can choose how you're going to feel about it. 
And this we'll, is how we deal with them. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask if, if uh, you had any strategies for when it falls in that territory of you're not sure whether you like it or don't like it. What about? Um, what was what, I was wondering if you had any any like sort of any like strategies for dealing with it when it's when it falls into that territory of you're not sure if you like it or you dislike it. You can say it's probably not dangerous. There's no reason to think that it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. We just don't know what it is right now. It's not harmful. Mm -hmm. Let's keep investigating. Mm -hmm. That's the answer in almost all cases to keep looking, to keep remembering to look, to keep investigating over and over and over again to keep investigating, keep looking, keep recognizing that the clinging that is happening, you can actually see that too and let it go. But in fact, this process of potential samapata is oftentimes very, very quick and repeated over and over and over again. And as it goes down or as it happens over and over, we get into worse states. Mm -hmm. So that first thought moment is a way of clinging. And we start going around with that. If we continue to do it, it's going to get bigger and bigger. This is what I'm getting at. But when we can catch it, when it's really little, aha, I see you. And now that's not who I am. We disidentify with it. Those feelings are not me. Those are not my feelings. They're just feelings. Mm -hmm. So we begin to objectify the feelings rather than make them part of the subject. Look at it from this perception. Most people, when we talk about anger, will use phrase like, I'm angry, I'm pissed off, mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm disgusted, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, you know, all of those kind of expressions. And you can see that is the identification with the feelings. I am angry. I'm angry. So when that angry feeling is there, it consumes one, and it's the, the self that's angry. That's, that's true, except that when we begin to understand it, no, that's not who I am. If anything, I'm the one who can see that anger, and I am not the anger. The anger is merely some bodily chemistry that's happening. Let's take a few deep breaths and slow down. I am not the anger. Okay, disidentify ourselves so we can actually begin to pull ourselves out of that woeful state of being in hell by recognizing that that hell is not who I am. That's not me. But we have to see that and recognize it for what it is and recognize, number one, that these are just instinctual behaviors and there's no self at the bottom of those instincts. They're just instincts. And whoever you are are better than your instincts. Getting the best part of the brain going or the best part of the mind, the frontal cortex, to get the adult open, awake, aware, or let us call it then the wisdom. So we keep bringing wisdom back in. We get look at what's going on. And when we can look and see it, we can recognize that's really not me. It's just anger. It's not my anger. It's not me that's angry. It's just anger. Begin to aden identify this stuff is not me, not mine. Nothing is worth clinging to as I, me, or mine, as Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa says, including the thoughts that make us angry. Those thoughts are not me. They're just thoughts. Comes out of the sankara, but all that past stuff, that's not me. The way I perceive things is not me. So when we re recognize it that way, that's really the teaching of Paticca Samapada is where does the self arise? The self is the one who jumps into hell. The one who mistakes, I am the feeling. Mm -hmm. The feeling is there and that's real. I am angry. That's delusional. So that's where we can take your clinging is the, the clinging is that step that we're at before we jump off the cliff. Who is it that's jumping off the cliff? It's not me, not really me. It's just an instinct, 
a false positive of fear, mostly. In fact, you could say that fear is the basis of all of our feelings in the sense of how much fear is in the mix. If fear is there, then we're going to have feelings like anger, sadness, frustration, anxiety, grief, ill will, remorse, regret, guilt. You've heard all of this list before. If you are in a position to where you're completely free from fear, then you're going to be safe, secure, satisfied, content, have the feeling of success and satisfaction. Your choice. Which side do you want to be on? So, so what's the trick? Like, so it seems like I can understand, like, kind of separating myself, like, seeing the anger instead of my anger. But, like, it mm -hmm. seems like it's, it's a little trickier of a move when it's like a survival drive, like hunger. Like, how do I, how how do I reckon to like find the balance between like seeing the hunger, acknowledging it as an object, not being my hunger, but that I still, you know, I don't have to get angry, but I do have to eat. Um. We could have the same conversation about breathing, and I would be more interested in that conversation, okay? <laughs> Let's look at it from hunger. Hunger is a biological response and reaction that is highly influenced by our society. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you live in a society, that the, the society itself, because of the way that it's structured, eats only two meals a day then those people will not be hungry throughout the day. But if you live in a country that has four meals a day or three meals a day, then in the middle of the day, they're going to be hungry. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because they're expecting to eat. The body expects to eat. It's pre-programmed to eat. If, if a, a community of people uh, eat four times a day, which is actually quite common, when they wake up in the morning at 4 a.m., they have a meal. When they, Then at about 8 in the morning, four hours later, they have another meal. And then noon, they have lunch. And then they have dinner. So they have four or five meals a day. Getting used to eating four or five meals a day after a year or two or three of that, and then you uh, come to mealtime, you get hungry, when in fact that's got nothing to do with it. Hmm. It's got to do with the hunger is because of the biological clocks that have been set through the practice and the habits of society. Right. So the Buddha recommends that we eat just once a day and to deal with that hunger. Now, going back to that point about breathing, you, you're going to die in the next two to five minutes if you don't breathe. But that's not true with hunger. Hunger, you can go 30, 40 days. In fact, that's one quite common and still is, is that people go on fast. It's been common for people to go on fast in times when there was no food, like in the winter time. That that's why bears, in fact, uh, get really, really robust and fat in the fall so that they can hibernate and not eat during the winter. Mm -hmm. Well, humans have gone long periods of time without eating also. That's why we have fat storage and other things like this because of that seasonal thing. So basically hunger is something that most people ignorantly think is not at all programmable to where in fact it's, it is. We've just given several examples of how it's programmed. And so the Buddha says, let's eat just one meal a day because that is what will really help with, the, um, with hunger that if you're used to eating one meal a day, then you tend to, um, at least in, in the beginning, you, you tend to work with the hunger differently. And one of the ways you can work with it differently is by saying, that's all right, I don't have access to food right now. Uh, at various watts in the United States, for instance, the monks live in a different house than where the food is. And so no monk is going to get up in the middle of the night and go across the watt just to break into the kitchen. Mm. All right. It's just not worth the effort. And so we deal with the hunger in the way of I can handle this. Never mind. Tomorrow is going to be OK. I'll survive until tomorrow morning and then I'll have something to eat. And there's no problem here. So we begin to deal with the hunger 
in due ways. Rather than, oh, I've got to eat. I feel so hungry. Why can't I eat? We change it to, no, I can handle this. I don't have to be uh, filled just because there's the feelings or sensations of hunger. There's another example of that, and that is, is that people who go on a dedicated diet that they really do want to lose weight. The way to do that is to by making friends with the hunger. Oh, I'm really glad to see the hunger back again. Why does that? Is because the hunger is is the actual telltale evidence that the body is drawing nourishment now from stored fat, not from the food that you're digesting because you're not digesting any food. And so there is the feelings of that that we're calling hunger, but it's just more of a feeling of emptiness. Mm-hmm. And that we can actually manage that feeling of emptiness happily. Oh, hello, hunger, my old friend. I'm glad to see you're making me thin again. <laughs> so it again, it has to do with our attitude about the food. And most people say, oh, well, uh, the hunger is part of the self-preservation instinct. If I don't eat, I'm going to die. No, you're not going to die. Not, not, not right away. Let's yeah. wait until you get down to, let us say, maybe 100 pounds or 120 pounds. Then we can talk about you being in serious danger. Mm-hmm. The 30-day fast and whatnot are quite common in the world. So let's not worry about hunger. Let's make hunger a friend because yeah. it can, in fact, be something that we can uh, modify, play with, uh, intentionally skip meals especially if this particular meal is going to be really hard to get, like there's no food in the house, then going out to eat. Why should people go out to eat? Why can't they just sit at home and be hungry? Mm-hmm. You're not going to die. Then in fact, they would probably be better off if they were a little thinner. So... Um, this is a way of beginning to understand the bodily sensations are not necessarily our enemies. Mm-hmm. That if a kid, a 14 year old has broken his arm and his arm is in a cast, he's right handed and his arm is broken right in this area. And every time he tries to move his hand, maybe he plays the trumpet or something like that. He can't play it because the bone hurts. What the bone is doing is the bone area is here is saying, stop doing all of that activity. We're trying to heal here. And if the boy will leave the hand alone and pay attention to this pain and notice that that pain is actually not just pain that he doesn't like and tries to get rid of while he's doing what he wants to do, he should see that that pain is actually a signal saying we need to rest. And so we can begin to pay attention to the sensations of the body in a much more, let us call it natural way, that they're giving us a message. And that the human mind is capable of ignoring those messages as great damage. So we should listen to the body and become alert to what the body has to say. Yeah, it's it's just confusing that it's like sometimes it's like, oh yeah, pay, like, pain is sending a message of like don't do that and we should listen to it but then like when you talked about a mosquito bite before like it's sending the message to scratch but we shouldn't do then in that case we don't want to listen to it that's because we need to listen to it wisely rather than just instinctually Mm -hmm. that's the development of the wisdom is to recognize that yes binding an arm and splinting the arm uh is very good medicine But going along and holding the arm and not doing anything to actually repair the arm while you're truly, and then the the arm will get really messed up, Mm -hmm. right? The same way with mosquito bites. If we have a mosquito bite and put some ointment on the mosquito bite, then, then everything will be fine because we're doing it wisely. We're doing it medically. We're doing it scientifically rather than doing what the child does, which is just scratch. Right. That's the wisdom is to start paying attention to what the body is saying wisely. Knowing, in fact, become your own medical doctor. Look at your body as 
something that a medical doctor would look at with great deals of understanding and study and knowledge and whatnot, as opposed to me, the body that goes to the doctor, complaining to the doctor about all of my pain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, start looking at yourself as if you, you, the wise part of your mind was actually a physician rather than the victim of the sensations to come out of that child ego state into the adult ego state is another way of speaking about it. That the adult or the uh, frontal cortex, the wise part of us, the scientist will take care. But we have been living our whole lives running around um, within a dialogue between the parent and the child with the child rebelling against everything the parent tells the child to do and uh, the child is um, feeling deprived. Mm -hmm. The child doesn't like that stretch. The child doesn't like that hunger. The child doesn't like the broken arm. The child doesn't like this, that, and the other thing, but the adult can handle it wisely. The adult could put some salve on that um, uh, mosquito bite. The, the, the wise part of the mind can splint that arm. The wise part of the mind can say, now is not the time to eat. This is not the right time. Let's not put a lot of effort into worrying about eating because right now is not the right time. Mm -hmm. So this is the way that we can begin to handle that is actually by changing the ego state that we're in, which actually means to wake up the frontal cortex to see how we create things, to see how we feel, to see how that feeling leads to longing and wanting and how that longing turns into clinging and how the clinging itself roasts us in hell. Mm -hmm. That's the particular Samapada of the Buddha. And we can fix that by finding it any particular pace. In other words, if you're already in hell, get yourself out of it. If you're at the point of clinging, stop clinging. If you're at the point of wanting, recognize that you that you like it, but you don't want it. And then you can back up a little bit further so that you begin to control how you feel about things. So you can choose wisely how you feel. Mm -hmm. There's even further steps, but that's a good one to, to, uh, to get practiced at. Yeah. Wisdom at Absolutely. the point of contact so that you know how you feel and you know that you can control how you feel. And if, and when it seems like it's permanent to like pay attention to the the passing away and the next mind moment arising. Yes, exactly. Look at the arising and the passing away and the arising and the passing away, knowing that you can actually begin to feed the mind wholesome thoughts. Yeah. To begin to change the way that you feel. Mm -hmm. Is that that? Is that that perception, salyantana, um, or actually perception in Sankara, salyantana, is the feeling uh, source. That's the thought. We have that thought. The thought impacts us. We feel. Mm -hmm. Thought, impact, feel. Thought, impact, feel. Thought, impact, feel. That whole little sequence over and over again, and we basically have a thought that then gives us a feeling of anxiety. Then we have the uh, the feeling, I don't like anxiety, which is another thought that gives us more anxiety. And so we actually pump ourselves up, or a better way of saying it is pump ourselves down <laughs> by doing it over and over and over again, that repetition of giving ourselves unwholesome thoughts to think. Yeah. And so we can begin to modify even the uh, Sankara so that we start feeding the perception machine more wholesome input for it to process the uh, uh, consciousness through. So yes, we can. We can change. We can change at each one of these steps along the way. This is why it's called Paticca Samapada Dependent Origination. You can see that upon the eye contact, consciousness, that generates a nama rupa or perception that gets the sankara to make a salayatana, and that is what we perceive, or that's what we 
uh, that's the thought, the saliatana, the internal representation, is what impacts us. So two guys can stand on the street corner and they can see a third person across the street coming in their direction, and each one of them has a completely different reaction to this guy or there's someone coming based upon the way that they're dressed and based upon prior knowledge. So let's give uh, an example that the person who is coming across this, from down the street is now seen to be wearing a nun's habit from the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. One of them is a Catholic. The other one was raised in Catholic school. Difference. <laughs> and they're certainly going to have a different reaction to, the, uh, to that nun's habit. And they have no clue about the human being that's in the habit. Mm-hmm. She could be in a Halloween costume. You don't know anything, but right. we naturally assume things because of dress. Okay, here's another example. Somebody comes down the street and two guys are looking and this guy is dressed in an SS uniform. Two different reactions. One of them happens to have been a German. The other one happens to be a Jew. They're going to have different reactions. Why? Based upon their past. So, it's not the presentation, present, presenting data. It's our past that filters and um, uh, processes that data into feelings. That that nun's habit or that SS uniform itself and in and of itself doesn't cause any particular feeling. It depends upon the sankara or the past of the observer. So this is literally the description of beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But so is fear. So is remorse. So is ugliness. So is a try. Everything is in the mind of the beholder, not in the object itself. Mm-hmm. Okay, so one guy gets a brand new Tesla and he just drives around with it because he loves the car. The other gets a brand new Tesla and he goes around the car with a microscope or a, uh, a magnifying glass looking for every defect in the car. Who is going to have the more joy and the more fun? <laughs> the first guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is the point that we're making is, is that the beauty that we perceive is actually coming out of our past experiences and our identifications of who we think we are. And when we give up these identifications, oh, I am not Tesla, or oh, I am not my feelings. Mm-hmm. That we stop identifying with that. So another way of saying it is, is that this is all a teaching of about anatta in the sense of figuring out who we are not. But most Westerners will come to the conclusion of, oh, that means that I'm going to then figure out who I am. (laughs) Sure. All right. And the answer to that is, no, that's the wrong question. Who I am is nothing but more garbage that's left. So let's not pay attention to who I was in the past or who I'm going to be in the future or what I'm going to do now that's going to get me into the future and all of that kind of stuff. That's not wise attention. What is wise attention? Paying attention to Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda, following the Eightfold Path, doing Anapanasati so that we can see deeply into the nature of the mind and make some changes. And so that means that who I actually am is a moving target. Mm -hmm. Who I am is what I'm seeing right now. The input that I'm taking in right now and the processing I'm doing right now, that's who I am. But tomorrow, it's going to be a different person. So there's no reason to try to figure out who we are. What we really need to do is to figure out what we're not. Mm -hmm. I am not my feelings. I am not the body. I am not the consciousness. I am not the perception. I am not even my old deep past, then what am I? I'm the one who likes and don't likes things to the point of doing something about it, like roasting myself in hell over it. (laughs) That's where the self comes from. It comes from the clinging. 
And so it's good that you're really on to this issue of the clinging. So you can back it up now to the point of, well, the clinging comes from the wanting. Mm -hmm. Can I back it up even to the further of recognize all the clinging and the wanting comes from the liking and the not liking? Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? That's back to the feelings. Exactly. So this is how you deal with the, the, uh, the craving is when you see a craving thought, recognizing or the craving feeling and the association of that, recognize that comes from a thought. And that seeing the craving is yet another thought. And then saying, wow, I'm so glad I can see that craving is yet another thought. And then relaxing, wow, I'm glad I don't have to crave. That's another thought. And so this is the process that we're going through is over and over again is to check that craving, recognize that that's coming out of a particular feeling that's ignorant, and we can take control over that feeling. We can feel the way we want to feel. Taking control of the, like breaking the chain of like habitual relating and taking control of the flow of thoughts, so you can move it in a joyful and positive con- direction. Absolutely. Excellent. I think you're beginning to get it. So this is how we're practicing Anapanasati, is to understand how to actually manipulate the mind out of the bad feelings that lead us into hell or into doing dumb work, uh, like becoming a stupid animal, doing what we're told to do and getting no benefit out of it. And that's where people find employment, because people really don't get great benefit out of the paycheck once a month. They're looking for more, and they never get any more. Mm-hmm. They're looking for, for satisfaction or fulfillment, and all they get is a pink slip. Yes. <laughs> And so that's the dumb animal. Let's see those kinds of clingings and and, um, uh, these woeful states that we wind up in so that we can back it up and recognize that, oh, it's because of the feelings that I have were, uh, were, they were caused by being impacted by thoughts and, and things that we had concocted in the mind. But that only takes like a tenth of a second, just one mind moment to dream up something, and then we're completely terrified. Mm -hmm. It takes a child only an instant to say, oh, there's a bear in the closet in his mind, and then he has the words and the fear of, oh, there's a bear in the closet to follow. And so when we recognize, oh, I have just have a thought there's a bear in the closet. Guess what? There's no bears in the closet. If you don't believe it, let's go check. Let's go figure that out. Let's go have a game of bear, bear, where's the bear? (laughs) Because there's no bears there. The only bear that's in the mind, that's the bear. And that's the the Saliatana. That's that place where we concoct these uh, fearful images. So that's how you can back that stuff up. You can come from the clinging back to the tanha, back to the grasping, or back to the wanting, back then to the feeling, back through the contact into the actual thing that created this, which was the unwholesome thought that we had. And so every time a thought of craving comes up or clinging, we can say, oh, I see that. But guess what? I really don't want it. Not right now. I'm so I'm satisfied without it. And that process has to happen over and over and over again. Because if you do it over and over again with clinging, the clinging just stays on and on and on. But every time a clinging thought comes up and you can then interrupt that with, I really don't need it right now. I don't have to think about it right now. Thinking about it causes me uh, suffering. So let's not think about it. Let's think about something that doesn't cause suffering. Mm-hmm. And that's the major change that one can make in one's life is to recognize that you don't have to think things that are going to make you feel bad. Mm-hmm. You can think things that are going to make you feel good and happy and content that you like things without wanting it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, as, as usual, you've given me a lot to work with. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, 
see see where where this takes me or where where I can take myself with this rather. <laughs> yes, this is really a pro profound and powerful teaching mm -hmm. and that it winds up being the practice of Anapanasati itself. Anapanasati is the practice of seeing how the mind works. And this is the sequence of events that I've just laid out for you. And so I'm glad that you can see the power of this. Mm -hmm. So this is how we would practice. By seeing that and saying, no, I'm going to make a different, I'm going to make a change here. I'm going to stop that thought and I'm going to put a thought in the mind that's going to allow me to feel safe and secure, comfortable and satisfied rather than having the thoughts about how dangerous that bear is in the closet. Let's go play, where's the bear, where's the bear? Let's go make this wholesome, okay? Let's make a game out of it. Rather than being terrified of the bear, we're, we're the boss of the bear. The bear now is hiding from us. <laughs> and so this is the way. I'm glad that you've gotten it. That's great. So you have anything else to say? No, I'm feeling... Feeling pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good with this conversation. Okay, Andrew, well, we'll see you again soon. Sounds good. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, I invite you to come join us on the Sangha. Yeah, I, I do try and make it when I can, but I uh, often have other other uh, activities during that time. But I will, yeah, I, I might be, I probably will be able to make it on Friday. Great. Okay, well, we'll see you. All right, see ya. Okay, bye-bye.